continuing our look into the ship origins from Star Trek, I thought we could take a step back from the newer vessels of contemporary Starfleet and instead look at something from the seldom explored missing era of the 24th century. Before the Galaxy class entered the scene, becoming the iconic Federation vessel, this bracket was filled by another all-rounder, the Ambassador class. The real-world origin for the design was from Rick Sternbach and derived from the concept work of Andrew Probert, with the idea that it would be the Enterprise C from the start. This facilitated the notion that it would appear as a stepping stone between the Excelsior and the Galaxy, which in Universe 2 is exactly what it is. Although the original concept is cool, it is not the vessel that ended up being seen on screen due to time constraints. For example, the elliptical deflector dish was simplified to a circular one, as was the primary hull. The neck, however, retained the striping effect seen on the Excelsior, although in a smaller capacity, and I think that the circular deflector and round saucer certainly give it a look closer tied to the ships of the 23rd century. The nacelle placement tinkered with the notion of having them raised over the saucer like a constitution class, but this was discarded because the balance looked off, and I agree. Plus, bringing them below the saucer shows up again in the galaxy design, the in-universe successor to the Ambassador class. The Ambassador class began life as the replacement for the Excelsior class as the Federation's primary capital ship, the sort of vessel that unified all the latest technological developments into a single design a capstone vessel of an era. Plans were drawn up in the mid-2310s, while the Excelsior was beginning to take a back seat after being the poster ship for several decades. The mission profile of the Ambassador was pretty much the same, to be the exploratory cruiser that could push that final frontier, and be equipped to handle any situation. It would also be one of the first ships to have extensive facilities for civilian life aboard it, with Starfleet officers' families being permitted to live aboard the vessel, a trend that would continue with the Galaxy class. The original Ambassador class, the USS Ambassador NX-10521, was constructed in 2319 under the supervision of Admirals Los Tirose Mentir and John Harriman, the latter being the former captain of the Excelsior class Enterprise B. The vessel was constructed at Hellespont Station near the Zenkethi Coalition space, where it rather visibly underwent extensive trials and testing cruises, done as a tactic to intimidate the increasingly aggressive Zenkethi basically a propaganda warning message aimed at making them think twice about attacking the UFP. Testing was promising, and the Ambassador line began production in 2322, several vessels joining the Ambassador which itself entered service in 2325. The class was 526 metres long, 283 wide, and 101.9 metres tall, covering 33 decks. The vessel had a crew of around 1,320 souls, but had an emergency capacity of 4,100 people. It weighed in at 3,710,000 metric tons, far too large for a comfortable atmospheric flight, let alone a planetary landing. Like the Constitution class that came before it, the Ambassador was not actually a stationary design and although not as major as the various Constitution refits over the years, the Ambassador designs did change with the emergence of new technologies leading to a number of minor differences in capability and appearance. Notably, the nacelles were changed somewhat in the underside of the saucer section. For around 11 years, the USS Ambassador itself remained a testbed for much of these newer developments, 
meaning that the vessel was constantly stationed near major fleet yards and successful developments were then implemented in newer ambassador ships. This means that there are numerous minor discrepancies with scale and abilities depending on when an ambassador was launched, but generally the newer the ship the better it performed. Because of this it is a little more difficult to pin down the specifics, but I assume most of these statistics are from ambassador vessels towards the end of the class's life cycle. All retained the same mission profile however, the vessel that was to be the face of the Federation. This level of utility and the numerous upgrades saw the ambassador remain through the Elkar's switchover from Duotronic to Isolinear computer systems, as well as numerous other developments that were a staple by the time of the next generation shows in ships like the Galaxy class. It also had phaser strips instead of the turret ports, which would go on to become standard for Starfleet going forwards. The ship was also surprisingly durable with powerful shield systems that could withstand firepower from multiple attackers. Its cruising warp velocity was at warp 7, which was one factor higher than the Galaxy class, although that vessel could comfortably travel at warp 8 too, while the Ambassador's maximum speed capped at warp 9.2, with engine shut down after 4 hours of sustained travel. The phaser strips were type 9 arrays, and it had 11 of them while it had a single fore and aft torpedo launcher. The Ambassador class saw its heyday in the early to mid 2300s, with one of their number of course being the successor to the Enterprise B launched in 2332. At the time of its launch, the Enterprise NCC 1701-C was likely the most advanced vessel produced. However, technology, as with all things, moves on, and like with the Constitution and Excelsior before it, there's only so much you can do with refits and overhauls before you may as well just produce a new vessel. This was the fate of the Ambassador class. Just as it had edged out the Excelsior before it, the Galaxy class design stepped up to take the mantle of frontline flagship design. Despite this, the Ambassador was still in service late into the 2360s, although such ships were increasingly rare. The line was not officially ended until 2372 when the Dominion War began. I assume this has simply coincided with the production of more specialised and advanced vessels, so Starfleet eventually put a halt to the Ambassador production in favour of these. Despite the ending of production, Starfleet did not simply retire its Ambassador ships, and they remained in service, with the USS Exeter in 2374 being one of the last operational ones. Although individual ships would not last anywhere near as long, the line as a whole enjoyed over six decades of service, taking second place in longevity to the Excelsior and Miranda classes which preceded it. Complete speculation now, but I assume the line was dropped because the Excelsior was already a great background workhorse vessel for the Federation and the Galaxy was more than suitable as an ambassador's replacement, so it was left in this middle ground of being too intensive to produce for menial tasks, and not up to date enough to stand alongside the new Galaxy and later ships. The Ambassador is not one of my favourite ships to be honest, but it still stands as a favourite among the fanbase at large, and it does however sit rather nicely in that role that it was supposed to fill, both in-universe and out, as the go-between for the Galaxy and Excelsior. It really does look like a proto-galaxy to me, but with plenty of old design elements from the lost eras of Star Trek. I feel like if you were to ask a Trek alien to draw a default Federation ship, they would sketch something that looked like an ambassador. It's not often that we get to see a class of ship shift throughout its life cycle, 
then again, not as many classes get to last as long as this either, and it adds a strong sense of continuity to the evolution of ship design to see these subtle variations with time. So, thank you for watching this video on the Ambassador class. Feel free to add some suggestions for me to cover in the comments below, and until the next video, thanks again, I've been Rick, and goodbye.